of McDowellian second nature subjectivity. Instead, substituting my subtractive gesture of decompleting first nature for McDowell's additive one of completing it with second nature, he and his followers would say, quote unquote, re-enchanting it. As McDowell fears, re-enchantment still sounds to my ears eerily like repackaged supernaturalism. This lets me affirm with McDowell the effective existence of autonomous subjects as loci of self-legislating conceptual spontaneity without flirting with the enigmas and riddles of the supernatural. McDowell insinuates, and certain Heideggerians wail, he insinuates that since the advent of modern science in the early 17th century, the disenchantment of the natural world has gone too far. A re-enchantment of nature is advanced as a well overdue remedy for the nihilism of a reality flattened out by the bulldozers of post-enlightenment secular sciences run amok. But if Lacan is right about both the ontotheological articles of metaphysical faith of apparently atheistic materialism, self akin to bald naturalism, as well as a post Freudian quote unquote triumph of religion in which spiritualist illusions enjoy a vibrant future alongside and partly thanks to the sciences of modernity, then a true scientific secularism has yet to arrive on the historical scene with anything close to full force. Lacan's claims aside, even if modern science has made inroads into disenchanting and desacralizing a number of things so that not all of them are airshining, it not only is far from having completely dislodged and destroyed the representatives of the enchanted and the sacred long present on the world stage, whereas religious and spiritualist worldviews have been around continuously for eons up through today, the Weltanschauung ushered in by Galileo and Bacon is, by comparison, a mere four centuries young, a blink of an eye blip relative to the deeply entrenched reign of obscurantist magic and mystery. Urging that re-enchantment deserves to be given a try is analogous to suggesting to the American voting public that they finally should bring themselves to consider electing a Christian male as their president. <laughs> the worn out Weberian tale of post-enlightenment secular scientific disenchantment has become ever more unrepresentative and one-sided, failing to reflect the past several decades of momentous developments in the sciences. With respect to pure mathematics, Alain Badiou makes his readers exquisitely sensitive to the missed opportunities resulting from the loosening of the historically tight tie between philosophy and mathematics from Plato to Kant. Starting with German idealism and romanticism in the late 18th and early 19th centuries, philosophical speculation in the continental European tradition, with a few exceptions, falls into a willful mathematical illiteracy ignoring in this peeling away the reality-shattering upheavals that soon ensue in mathematics as a revolution associated with the proper name Georg Cantor. But you admirably demonstrates that contemporary philosophy has everything to gain and nothing to lose that isn't worth losing, from buckling down to some long overdue catch-up work on almost two centuries worth of groundbreaking mathematical thought. In this spirit of Badiou's philosophy, but against its letter, insofar as he and I are at loggerheads about the place of things biological. I seek to diagnose a widespread scientific illiteracy afflicting philosophers, mainly but not exclusively continentalists, and allied theorists in the humanities, an ignorance lulling them into complacently and repetitively chanting inaccurate or false mantras about disenchantment. Although, in reaction to talk of re-enchantment, I am tempted to cry out, give disenchantment a chance, as fellow speaker Ray Brazier does in his delightfully provocative 2007 book, Nihil Unbound, Enlightenment and Extinction. This would not be an entirely accurate reflection of my views, in that quote-unquote disenchantment risks connoting the reductionism of all too typical naturalisms. As indicated above, and at odds with Brazier's nihilistic leanings, tendencies with a taste for Churchlandian eliminative materialism, something we can talk about uh, hopefully at length later today, I share with McDowell a commitment to shoring up the position of the subject of freedom. But, unlike McDowell, I am confident this can be accomplished without a flicker of re-enchantment 
and on the basis of the very sciences he suspects, wrongly in my estimation, of being incorrigibly complicit with far from enchanting bald naturalism. Furthermore, this subtractive gesture of mine, that is the decompletion of first nature, is intimately linked with my above-mentioned theoretical interpretation of contemporary biology and its offshoots. In addition to my no first nature brain, no second nature subject axiom slash intuition, I also push off from the decided upon thesis that, to paraphrase and over paraphrase Winston Churchill, the sciences of modernity of a quote unquote disenchanted nature are the worst platforms for speculating about human subjectivities except for all those others utilized from time to time. However, on my Hegelian dialectical phenomenological reading, the life scientific rendition of human beings coming together at present utterly undermines bald naturalism and lends crucial empirical experimental, that is non-supernatural support, to a naturalism along the lines of McDowell's quote unquote naturalized Platonism. What neither McDowell nor Pippin countenance is the possibility that the ideology of bald naturalism as a scientism is nowadays being falsified by the same sciences misleadingly idolized by reductive and eliminative naturalist ideologues. Arguably, these sciences are in the midst of decompleting themselves, intra-scientifically tracing the epistemological and ontological boundaries of scientific jurisdictions of covered entities, events, and explanations a potential filled development ignored by those philosophers like McDowell and Pippin who feel the need philosophically to bring a non-scientific limiting check externally to bear on the sciences. For example, epigenetics, about which Kathleen will be speaking later today. Epigenetics quite plausibly can be understood as an intragenetic theory of how significantly more things than just genes play essential regulatory roles in genotype-phenotype configurations. This can be finessed as a simple yet powerful example of a science performing a Gödelian-style jujitsu trick of determining itself to be, in Lacanese, quote-unquote, not all, incomplete with respect to interpenetrating fields and structures, mediating its own domains, and prompting it to surpass itself in demarcating its self-defined borders between itself and its quote-unquote extimate others, to borrow from Lacan again a neologism designating a dialectical paradoxical intimate exteriority. One of the crucial lessons of the chapter on observing reason in Hegel's 1807 Phenomenology of Spirit, the chapter famously leading to the scathing discussions of physiognomy and phrenology, one of its crucial lessons is that the modern sciences, left to their own devices, eventually give rise imminently out of themselves to notions, life is the paradigmatic one here, to notions which they thereafter cannot recapture within the confines of their prior worldviews, worldviews along the lines of McDowell's bald naturalism. With regard to the sciences, McDowell and Pippin do not think to practice Hegel's phenomenological procedure of stepping back in a hands-off manner, letting these figures or shapes of consciousness unfold their resources, or, as Hegel also portrays it, do violence to themselves at their own hands, unfold their resources while quote-unquote looking on, and philosophically narrating, recollecting the dialectical results. McDowell's Hegel is an anti-foundationalist, but as an anti-foundationalist, who also is an objective realist qua absolute idealist with a philosophy of nature, Hegel holds out the alluring philosophical possibility to his readers of ontologically, and not just epistemologically, reimagining first nature, such that the presuppositions underpinning the McDowell-Pippin altercations about science-informed naturalism simply fall away. In an article on McDowell and Hegel, Robert Stern cast McDowell's naturalism as a more moderate and reasonable version of Hegel's Naturphilosophie, which by contrast is implied to be immoderate and unreasonable. But Stern, later in the same article, praises Hegel's philosophical immodesty contra McDowell's modesty in terms of the latter's cautious approach, refraining from musings on the historical, religious, political, etc. facets of his epistemologically oriented considerations. And this without Stern noting the tension between his assertions. Akin to Stern's second line of thought here, 
Colgate inveighs against what he alleges is Pippin's excessively, excessively Kantianized quasi-Hegelianism, a Kantianism going back to Pippin's 1989 book, Hegel's Idealism, The Satisfactions of Self-Consciousness, and foreshadowed by Beatrice Longinesse's 1981 study, Hegel and the Critique of Metaphysics. Hulgate thereby contests the post-Charles Taylor portrait of a non-realist, socio-historical constructivist Hegel, which McDowell falls short of fully and decisively repudiating despite his own objective realist qua absolute idealist pensions. In one of his early reactions to Pippin, McDowell retreats into a deflated pseudo-Hegelianism, arguing that he too, like Pippin's social rationality pragmatist Hegel, can and does, quote unquote, leave nature behind. In the vein of the proceeding, I wish to confront both McDowell and Pippin with a properly and appropriately sadistic rallying cry. Gentlemen, one more effort if you would be Hegelians. The stage is now finally set for engaging productively with Cartwright's contributions to the philosophy of science as highly pertinent to the controversies dealt with above in connection with McDowell and Pippin. Her superb 1999 treatise, The Dappled World, The Study in the Boundaries of Science, the title is taken from Gerard Manley Hopkins' poem, Pie of Beauty. This treatise supplies a re-envisioning of both the sciences as interrelated disciplines and the objective world they pinpoint that thoroughly demolishes various dogmas about the scientific, the naturalistic, and their rapport, dogmas underpinning much of what is said by McDowell, Pippin, and a horde of others. McDowell's post solarsian epistemology of perceptual experience can be viewed as a sort of attenuated empiricism, an empiricist phoenix rising from the ashes of those of its predecessors which relied upon the exploded myth of the given. Cartwright self-identifies as an empiricist, albeit like McDowell, as a realist one. Her book tackles both physics as the epitome of the natural sciences and economics as a paradigmatic social science. My present agenda compels me to focus on her handling of physics. One of Cartwright's fundamental conclusions is that any realist empiricist who looks closely and honestly at the actual, not to mention historical, state and achievements of the sciences within and between themselves will be pushed towards subscribing to the Weltanschauung, or it could be said anti-Weltanschauung, relative to what usually counts as one, the Weltanschauung of the dappled world. This phrase from Hopkins refers to objective reality as a hodgepodge patchwork of relatively or absolutely autonomous regional domains of entities and events, and this by contrast with an image of the world as a unified field of forces and phenomena grounded upon and governed by a single set of universally valid physical laws. The non-dappled world obviously resembles the picture of nature at the base of bald naturalism as characterized by McDowell. On the very first page of the dappled world, Cartwright declares, quote, the disorder of nature is apparent. We need good arguments to back the universal rule of law, end quote. She then sets about making the case that any such good arguments are lacking and that superior arguments testify in favor of an anti-fundamentalist, quote unquote, local realism. Fundamentalism here designates faith in the possibility of reducing everything to a single set of universal laws. Cartwright thinks that even the most wide-ranging cause and effect connections fall short of being universal, although she doesn't thereby commit herself to denying that these connections are true in the standard scientific sense. A Hegelian would say correct rather than true. Additionally, and perhaps unintentionally echoing the Hegel of the phenomenology, Specifically, the examination of the dialectics afflicting the concept of law in the third chapter on force and the understanding, appearance in the supersensible world. Cartwright indicts universalism for driving itself into the vacuity of a near empty general unity, powerless to account for the vast majority of the rich, multifaceted manifestations readily apparent in observed reality. Cartwright's local realism refuses to accept the oft-assumed equivalence between scientific realism and fundamentalist universalism. 
As regards the multiple branches and sub-branches of the sciences, she rightly notes that, quote, there is no system, no fixed relations among them, end quote. And, quote, there is no universal cover of law, end quote. The notion that the entire sprawling spectrum of the multiple natural sciences reduces down in the end to whatever present best physics alone posits in the form of its sole bundle of fundamental laws is a matter of unproven and at least practically, if not in principle, unprovable faith, not established fact. Hence, for a strict empiricist, the diverse sciences provide no solid empirical grounds for concluding that the ostensibly objective realities they investigate ultimately are bound together into a seamless, homogeneous whole, a monochromatic totality, exhaustively organized by the forces of a coherent, solitary ensemble of basic causal rules. What's more, for a realist who registers the fact of this non-unified disciplinary diversity within a wider perspective informed by knowledge of the history of the sciences, the sheer weight of all the available evidence tilts the balance heavily for the dappled worldview and against the flat uniformity of fundamentalist universalism. As Cartwright expresses this, quote, the claims to knowledge we can defend by our impressive scientific successes do not argue for a unified world of universal order, but rather for a dappled world of modeled objects, end quote. Her empiricist local realism commits her to a stance she labels, quote, metaphysical nomological pluralism, end quote. In particular, Cartwright's innovative concept of the quote-unquote nomological machine is indispensable for an adequate and fair assessment of her unorthodox philosophy of science. She segues into the formulation of this concept through considerations concerning Keteris paribus, with all other things being the same or with all other things being equal or held constant, Keteris paribus caveats in the sciences. Apropos physics, Cartwright observes that its models of applicability are very narrow and limited, namely, far from universal in scope of application. And this because scientific experiments need to set up arrays of tightly constraining, quote unquote, shielding envelopes so as to isolate specific phenomena and protect them from confusing, disorienting contamination by a swarming multitude of unpredictably variable real-world conditions that would compromise or disrupt the Keteris Paribus closure demanded by the methods of scientific practice and its requirements for arriving at acceptable explanations. Not only, as she states in conformity with her refusal erroneously to conflate realism with fundamentalist universalism, not only does, quote, predictive closure among a set of properties not imply descriptive completeness, end quote, nature appears non-dappled that is, homogeneous, lawful, regular, seamless, uniform, and so on, exclusively under the exceptional artificial circumstances arranged in advance by scientific experimental apparatuses of extremely constricted, that is, shielded range. In his 1973 book, Anti-Nature, Elements for a Tragic Philosophy, Clement Rosset foreshadows some of Cartwright's proposals with his anti-naturalist, quote-unquote, artificialism, of thoroughly contingent, radically aleatory materialities. Rosset's position opposes itself to those naturalisms continuing to suffer from lingering ontotheological illnesses diagnosed by Nietzsche and Lacan, among others. This artificialism performs a counterintuitive 180 degree about face, according to which the fabricated laws of artifice are the models for the laws attributed to nature and not vice versa. Likewise, Cartwright states, quote, for the most part, the laws of physics are true only of what we make. The social constructivists <coughs> tend to be scornful of the true part, end quote. Cartwright's realism leaves her utterly unsympathetic to the illegitimate drawing of anti-realist, what she here waves at with the phrase social constructivist, to the illegitimate drawing of anti-realist conclusions on the basis of affirming the contrived, fabricated nature, or anti-nature, of experimental scientific praxis. Although artificial, the causal laws extracted from, rather than proceeding as producing, 
The causal laws extracted from experiments and their experimentally mediated phenomena are nonetheless true qua real patterns in hearing an objective mind independent reality. The Cartwrightian idea of the nomological machine has been hovering in the wings of this discussion for a while. It now can be defined explicitly with brevity and straightforwardness. Cartwright's dappled world is a fragmented, heterogeneous universe without underlying, unifying fundamental laws. In hybrid, Lacanian, Badewian locution, a non-all, not one, a cosmos of being. This universe is indigenously populated by a detailized <coughs> jumble of a plethora of nomological machines, some involving humans and many, in fact most, not. Inverting a traditional view, Cartwright contends that nomological machines, as kludge-like assemblages, contraptions, or collages of a multicolored montage of mixed constituents, nomological machines generate laws and not the other way around. As she articulates this with a strange rarely, which appears in place of the never to be expected at this point, quote, it is rarely laws that are fundamental, end quote. In order to operate effectively, these machines need some form of the above-mentioned shielding, whether supplied by people or non-human variables, such as the sort of shielding relied upon by experimental setups requiring the closed status of Keteris Paribus conditions. The laws thus generated are as transitory as the fragile, impermanent machines, as configurations and constellations of components brought together in any number of fashions, as the fragile and permanent machines giving rise to them. As a corollary to this, she stipulates, quote, we get no regularities without a nomological machine to generate them, end quote. And as an encore in which she sings a bit of music pleasing to attuned Marxist ears, she includes, quote unquote, socioeconomic machines amongst those myriad nomological machines responsible for producing and reproducing the regularities of the modern scientific and capitalist world. On the basis of the entire ensemble of interlinked claims and arguments from the dappled world summarized up to now, Cartwright <coughs> permits herself to put forward some far reverberating theses. Denying that there are an objective reality, quote, regularities all the way down, end quote, she condemns hard-nosed determinism as a dogmatic metaphysical doctrine held to on the baseless base of an irrational faith aggressively blind to a wealth of facts glaringly visible to an empirically responsive and responsible gaze. Instead, Cartwright's dappled world is one of, quote, Keteris Paribus laws all the way down, end quote. At this juncture, I want to advance and defend the following proposal. The autonomous, qua reflexively self-legislating subject of German idealism at the heart of McDowell's relaxed platonic naturalism of second nature is a special sort of Cartwrightian nomological machine, namely what perhaps could be dubbed a quote-unquote logological machine with redoubling of logos in logological signaling the reflexive second nature of auto-determining subjectivity. Cartwright's analyses of the concept of law, like Hume's analyses of the concept of causality, blur the boundaries between the natural, social, and human sciences. Related to this, she allows for a diverse, kaleidoscopic grab bag of heterogeneous components as providing the ingredients for creating nomological machines broadly defined. This bag contains not only matter in motion as per the physical sciences, but also elements drawn from cultures, histories, languages, and so on. This allowance on her part licenses and underwrites my proposal to consider the constituents of second nature buildum as coming together in certain instances, along and combined with constituents from first nature, to form logological machines as peculiar varieties of nomological machines. Lacanian ears hopefully hear echoes of Lacan's subject of the signifier in all of this. Abruptly jumping to a completely different but similarly topical reference, my modified appropriation of Cartwright's work renders superfluous anything like Roger Penrose's quantum physicalist stab at a solution to the hard problem, as per the legendary flop that is his 1989 book, The Emperor's New Mind. One doesn't need to go this far down to the weird worlds of quantum realities to find the wiggle room of indetermination and queer temporal torsions 
of sequences characteristic of minded subjectivity. In comparison with the minimalist austerity of McDowell's generally cautious Wittgensteinian therapeutic epistemology, according to which there is nothing requiring the default assumption of bald naturalism, having it that nature in its entirety is a freedomless realm of causal laws. Cartwright boldly forms a rich, robust ontology in which there is something, indeed quite a lot in fact, both scientifically and philosophically pushing toward the verdict that bald naturalist assumptions about nature are actually false as ideological scientific myths distorting true reality as it is in and for itself. For her philosophy of science, as for Hegelian natur philosophy, McDowell does not go far enough by resting content with showing the mere non-mandatory standing of bald naturalism's nature as a picture of nature überhaupt. Given McDowell's professed Hegelianism, he can't stop this short even by his own lights. Furthermore, Cartwright would see McDowell as gravely erring in conceding that the image of nature as an enchained domain of inviolable laws of efficient causality is valid, at least within the narrower confines of empirical, experimental, scientific practice. This already is to concede too much. Cartwright's metaphysical pluralism of nomological machines upends the very idea of natural law McDowell, Pippin, and so many others take for granted in the background as unproblematic, at least when not extended beyond its purportedly proper scientific disciplinary spheres. Cartwright's philosophical and scientific overthrowing of the idea of law grounding bald naturalism, in conjunction with my move of extending the concept of the nomological machine to cover subjectivity via the concept of the logological machine, sort of a tongue twister, this lays the first programmatic bricks of a road to an ontologized, realist variant of McDowell's quasi-naturalism of second nature. This variant is, by contrast with McDowell's own, both open to being informed without being threatened by the natural sciences suitably conceived, as well as fortified against the intellectually dangerous risks of appearing to grant any room whatsoever for supernaturalist dualisms. Neither heteronymously regulated by the non-dappled world of bald naturalism's fundamentalist universalism, nor frictionlessly spinning in the void of arbitrary caprice and chance, the self-legislating subjects of logological machines, like those of Hegel and McDowell's neo-Hegelianism, are eminently transcendent inhabitants of a dappled world as the best portrait of an enriched but not enchanted nature qua detotalized, self-sundering, and piebald, rather than just plain bald, piebald expanse of motley clusters of patchwork substances with their wonder-inducing Frankenstein-like beauty. At the end of the fourth lecture of Mind and World, McDowell provides his audience with a condensed statement of the biggest ambitions aspired to by his attenuated naturalism. In subtle resonance with the Solarsian program, to steer along the fault lines between what Sellers designates in his 1962 essay, Philosophy and the Scientific Image of Man, as the quote-unquote manifest and scientific images of human beings. McDowell announces, quote, my proposal is that we should try to reconcile reason and nature, end quote, and proceeds to herald the possibility that, quote, we could achieve a firm hold on a naturalism of second nature, a hold that could not be shaken by any temptation to lapse back into ordinary philosophical worries about how to place minds in the world, end quote. Albeit speaking of this possibility, not as, quote, a bit of constructive philosophy of the sort Rorty aims to supersede, end quote. That is, an ontology or metaphysics beyond the conservative limits of epistemological linguistic criticism. But instead, as the promise of philosophical peace and quiet sought after by Wittgenstein-inspired therapeutics. <laughs> Through an imminent critique of McDowell's project in conjunction with other select sources of inspiration, I believe that I've offered in this text, quote, a bit of constructive philosophy, end quote, achieving some of the main aims of mind and world while circumventing its above-identified pitfalls. Christoph Helbig complains that, quote, McDowell's relaxed naturalism is vexed with structural problems which call for a solution in terms of constructive philosophy, end quote. And that, quote, 
There is a problem with nature which even McDowell's relaxed naturalism has not laid to rest and which is still in need of a solution which only constructive philosophy can provide, a solution which McDowell still owes us." End quote. Betraying the Wittgensteinian letter in favor of the Hegelian spirit of McDowellian philosophy, I tried to provide in this intervention such a solution left owed as an outstanding debt by McDowell himself. I think my dialectical approach to these problems empowers one to begin getting a solid realist grip on, quote, how to place minds in the world, end quote. And this, thanks to an image of the sciences and their worlds, largely unavailable to Sellers, as well as, of course, to Hegel, and entirely overlooked by McDowell et al. This approach is nothing other than what I've called before an existential transcendental materialism of a weak nature alone. An approach in which a non-unified multitude of natural materialities is the primordial existence in relation to which all essences are internally arising outgrowths, nevertheless coming to acquire a transcendent while imminent more than natural autonomy. The Lacan who evocatively speaks of, quote, the dehiscence from natural harmony required by Hegel to serve as the fruitful illness, life's happy fault, in which man, distinguishing himself from his essence, discovers his existence, end quote, is one of its several founding forefathers. Hegel is another, especially the Hegel, who authors the Encyclopedia of the Philosophical Sciences and repeatedly refers to nature as omechtig qua powerlessness, out of which the power of spirit, Geist, emergently arises through a dialectical process that could be baptized, toying with the Christian theological language, irreligiously rearticulated by Hegel, as a reverse kenosis of impotent nature. Lacan renders this natural powerlessness as, quote, the fruitful illness, life's happy uh, fault, end quote, qua a, quote unquote, dehiscence from natural harmony within nature more than nature itself. And Pippin refers to a, quote unquote, radical underdetermination. He shows no inclination to relate to Hegel's objective realist as absolute idealist on macht of nature. In a manner crucially illuminating the wider cross-resonating vistas of the social, political, economic, and religious stakes of the current conjuncture, within which philosophy is always is situated, a Hegelian-style phenomenological observation of today's natural sciences brings to light nothing less than a new, liberating vision of humanity fulfilling the theoretical hopes of Hegel's true leftist heirs. Thank you.